Okay. Um, all right, everyone. So um, thanks for stopping by today. So sorry that we've kind of had some a uh, little bit of confusion, a little bit of technical difficulty. So I don't know if you all read that announcement that I just posted uh, a couple of minutes ago. Turns out that the reason why we were having trouble on Monday was because uh, for some reason, which we still don't know why, um, the collaborate function on Blackboard is no longer there because uh, it was, well, we do know why, but I don't know why it happened, but but supposedly, because uh, I didn't know that collaborate was was different from Blackboard, but supposedly that collaborate got bought out by another company. So now Blackboard's not allowed to use it. So uh, we had to, so I guess right now Blackboard doesn't really have a, an embedded uh, meeting software system, whatever you want to call it. So we're going to have to use Zoom then, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, so we're going to have to do that and we'll have to meet that way, which is fine. I mean, it, it's the same basic thing. It's just that uh, it was just easier to go and collaborate because you would just have to click into the class. Now we're going to have to click into Zoom and all this. So, so it's a little bit more legwork. But once you get in, it's pretty much the same thing where we can uh, meet here uh, via the internet and all that. So um, let me also mention, first off, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, uh, well, first, what we're going to do today is, okay, let someone, someone else showing up. Okay, so I still have a couple more people. Uh, so, some more people are still uh, trickling in right now. So uh, what I wanted to mention, of course, first is that, um, and of course, I want to do this on Monday, but that's fine. We'll do it today, is um, I wanted to go over the syllabus. Uh, I know I, I had scheduled something for yesterday, but I don't think anyone was it was available to meet, so we didn't have that meeting, so we're just going to meet right now. Um, so I wanted, you know, I want to try to make up that meeting, but that's 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 fine. We can just we can just move forward from here. But uh, so I wanted what I wanted to do is I wanted to go over the syllabus today. Um, I think some of you have had a chance to kind of go through it already, right? Uh, it should be there on uh, it should be there on your blackboard there, um, you know, in one of the first modules and all that. Which so we'll go over the syllabus. I'm also going to walk you through how the class looks in terms of the class setup, so that way you can know where everything is. And you know, I've tried my best to kind of make the class as user friendly as possible so that you all will be able to access uh, you know you know the, the, the different modules and the requirements within our class that you'll be able to access it in a uh, in a streamlined as easy as possible type of way because I know every professor is different in terms of how they set up their classes so you know I've been teaching at STC this is my sixth year teaching uh, you know pretty much been uh, you know, I've been, I've been, you know, teaching all these different types of classes, whether it's in person or online. And so I've, I've tried my best to to try to craft my class setup uh, in a way that, you know, will not be as confusing, especially because I know what it's like to be in, in, in these like in these online classes where things like the professor doesn't doesn't make things like really easy to find or readily available or they're, you know, when I was taking, you know, online classes, I was always worried that there'd be like some mystery assignment buried somewhere deep in the class that I didn't, um, you know, that, that I never, you know, that I, I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to find and, and things like that. So that's not going to be the case with me. Everything's going to be very straightforward. Everything's going to be available. And let me silence my phone, sorry. Um, but yeah, that's the way everything is going to be set up. And, you know, it shouldn't be it shouldn't happening. Be happening. Um, but okay, so with that being said, um, I also wanted to mention one other thing that some students have been emailing me and messaging me about. Um, they have, some of the students that have signed up in this class have been bringing up concerns about the, you know, the meeting times, right? Because some students were not aware that this class was gonna have set meeting times. And, and I do understand where they're coming from because, you know, I've, I've been at SCC for six years and, this concept of an online synchronous class is rather new for STC and, and, and new for a lot of departments, because for the most part, STC has really only offered the online asynchronous, right? We're just kind of just doing, you know, you're not really having any class meetings or doing stuff, you know, you're just kind of doing stuff at, you know, on your time and meeting the deadlines and things like that, but not actually meeting, you know, at a set time. Um, but other universities do use the synchronous system. In fact, uh, last year I took a online uh, government class uh, at UTSA, and that was a setup where we had the synchronous meetings, right? Where we actually had class meetings, you know, every week. So it's basically the the synchronous setup is basically like it was if you were actually doing an in person class, just meeting over the internet. So it wouldn't be any different, right? You still have the lectures and the class meetings and all that. We're just meeting online, but those aren't as popular as like the online asynchronous, where you just kind of just you have the the due dates and then you just kind of do the work at your own pace as long as you meet the deadlines and things like that. I think that's what most people are used to. 
So because SCC, because this is something that SCC is doing that's relatively new, I've been getting a lot of messages from students that weren't aware that there were class meeting times. And I know uh, some of them have had issues with work, you know, and, and, and just lack of availability. So I wanted to mention that if something like that comes up with you all, if, you know, if, if uh, like, I don't want you to have to like, choose between like your work and this class, right? Uh, because of the the lack of awareness and the confusion, I want for, for students to know, and I'll respond to the students also that if you can't make it, you can't make it, okay? I'm not gonna penalize you. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do things like that uh, because I understand that, that this is kind of a new concept. However, though, if you are able to show up, I do expect you all to show up. And, um, you know, so, so, so I know, so I appreciate you all, you know, definitely, you know, showing up for these meetings. Uh, the meetings are going to be recorded, so you should be able to um, you should you should be able to see them later on. But the reason why I say that I still expect for you all to meet is because I don't want for for those of you in the class to be like, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, then then we're not just going to show up because if nobody shows up, then we can't have a meeting, right? So so we still have to have people showing up so we can have the meetings, and so that way they can be recorded, right? So we still need you know at least some people to show up so that that way we can still run the meetings and things like that. So that's why if, if you are able to come. The expectation is that you'll still be here. I'll still be here um, and things like that. So, you know, so that's that's the expectation that I still have. So does that make sense to everyone that if you are able to meet, uh, please definitely meet so that that way we can have meetings so that you all can watch something that, you know, if you want to go back and, and, and listen to the recordings, you're more than welcome to do so, as well as for the students who uh, signed up, but they didn't know that it that there was set meeting times and now they're all worried because of that, which, like I said, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to get back to them individually on that, but but that way, um, so that we all know that that if you can make it, definitely do make it. Um, okay. Anyway, and so and and of course, this is also a good thing because in these meetings, we can, like I said, we're we're going to make it look, look we're going to basically make it like as if it was a regular class, where um, you know you can ask questions. You know, obviously, of course, we're going to go over material, but we can also uh, we can also do like some review sessions and things like that, like studying for the exams or things like that. So there's a lot that we can do. I also do tutoring with the CLE. Uh, I do the virtual tutoring. So if you all uh, need any tutoring, you can stop by. Um, I, I I need to, I still haven't figured out what the the hours are going to be for the tutoring, but I'll, I'll uh, let you all know. I'm, I, it's probably going to be during my, my office hours, uh, the virtual ones, and then I also have some in-person ones at STC. So uh, that's when I can log in and, and, and help you all with some tutoring. But um, but I'll let you all know. I'll, I'll let you all know once I get that a little bit squared away, once I set up the schedule with the CLE. It's because it's the first week, so we're still kind of like uh, shuffling and trying to get a lot of stuff done. So, you know, just to get everything set up. So, okay. But with that being said, does anyone have any questions so far for me? Before we start going over the syllabus, does anyone have any questions for me uh, in regards to the class? Okay, so no questions so far. So then, okay, so then everything should make sense in terms of what I've been saying right now. Okay, so then what I'll do right now is let me go ahead and get to the syllabus really quickly. And what I'll do is uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go over the syllabus, we're gonna cover the the main parts of the syllabus and um, and then uh, and then towards the end, I'll walk you through the Blackboard setup so that way you all can, you know, kind of be aware in terms of how it, um, you know, how it looks and how it operates. Because like I said, every professor is different. So, okay. So let me go ahead and share my screen here so that you all should be able to see. Let me share the screen here. So where's the... Hmm. Wait, hold on, hold on. No, that's not it. Hold on. So for some reason, it's not showing. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, everyone. So uh, just let me know if you all are able to see the screen. Can you all see the, the screen uh, with the syllabus? I think you all should be able to see it, right? Um, let me just check the chat really quickly. Okay, yes. Okay, you all can see it. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and continue. Okay, so this is, of course, is uh, this is Texas government uh, 2306. Um, and again, this is, of course, the, the online synchronous class. Um, so let me go over the contact information first and then we'll go to the course description. So again, so my name is Mr. Gonzalez. I'm going to be your instructor for uh, Government 2306. Uh, this is my uh, contact information. So um, what I would recommend for you all to do is if you're going to contact me, I would probably recommend uh, either email, which my email is very easy to remember. It's aagonzalez uh, at southtexascollege.edu. I know some of my colleagues will have like numbers in their email, but 
you know, that's like, that, that'd be like, if let's say you were like Juan Garcia or something like that, you know, that's, it's a very common name. So of course there's going to be numbers because, you know, which one is it? But, uh, but for me, um, it's just my, my first name. Cause I think there's, there, there's probably several A Gonzalez's, right. But maybe not too many A, a Gonzalez's because it's my first, it's the, the first initial of my first name, the, the first initial of my middle name, and then my, my full last name. So it's pretty easy to remember. Um, a. a Gonzalez at South Texas College at ADU. Of course, you can also send uh, Blackboard messages, which um, let me show you all really quickly. Let, let me go ahead and, and go over here. Quickly. Let, let me show you all the, uh, uh, I know there's a video right here that talks about the SEC Blackboard messaging protocol. So let me go and yeah, there's some messages here. I'll respond to them right now, but let me, let me, uh, let me go ahead and uh, walk you all through in terms of what that video means. So if you watch, th this is what the video is. So, so you don't have to watch the video after I'm going to show you all. So the reason why I've instituted this messaging protocol is because for ever since Blackboard started moving over to the Ultra, I really didn't have this problem in the original Blackboard. But in this new Blackboard, I've had problems where students have sent me messages and I can't find the messages. They disappear, things like that. And then students will be like, well, sir, I sent you a message. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, I can't find it. So what I, what, what I came up with is a way for me to know that there's messages in Blackboard. And I do like that now they have the, the, little, the little alerts there. They didn't used to have that. That's a new thing, so I like that as well. But what I still want y'all to do is that if you're gonna send me a message, then I want for y'all to click this. Click send an email copy to recipients because what this will do is that this is going to send me an email that there is a message that's been sent in Blackboard, okay? So I need for you all to, if you're going to use the messaging app, you can either email me or you can use the messaging app. Anytime you send a message to me in Blackboard, you need to click on this on this tab right here so that that way it generates an email, you know, uh, letting me know to my STC email, letting me know that there's messages that have been sent. Now, other learning management systems that I use, uh, as I've taught at other colleges and universities, uh, they use, uh, they, they have a system where, when you send a message in the, cause it's called a learning management system. That's what Blackboard is. It's called an LMS, a learning management system. Other LMSs allow for you to just respond to that message when it gets to your email. Um, unfortunately, Blackboard doesn't do that where I can't just respond to that email that gets sent that there's a message being sent. It's just like alerting me. It's kind of like, I don't know if you're, well, no, this is this is definitely before your times. Before we had cell phones, we had like pagers where, uh, you know, and then you would have to go and call that person. Uh, so this is kind of like the, the pager, but I can't respond to the paging, right? You know, I have to go and then call, right? So so it'd be nice if I could just respond to the message in my email, but unfortunately I can't. So it just prompts me that I have to log into Blackboard and then respond to the message, which I'm in the process of letting Blackboard know that it would be much easier if I could just respond to that message just in my email instead of having to click into Blackboard. But regardless, that's not that's not y'all's problem. So just, just go ahead and send, you know, click on that. For any message that you send, click on that, and then it'll generate an email saying that you've sent the message, and so that way I'll know to respond, okay? So that's pretty much all that that video was about. So just uh, just keep that in mind. Make sure that uh, uh, make sure that you're, you're, you're clicking on this, um, because I do check. Like, I do check to make sure, like, let's say I get a message, and then I check to see if they sent, if, if that email generated, and if they did it, I'm going to tell you, hey, you need to click on that. Uh, because again, I don't want any problems to where if the if there's an issue with the messages. Okay, so so does that make sense in terms of the protocol? If you're going to send a message, make sure that you click on it. Okay, and like I said, I'm going to get back to these uh, messages here. So um, so I will get back to. Okay, let me let me go back over here. Um, okay, we'll, we'll we'll look we'll look at that later. Oh wait, hold on, sorry. Okay, let me share again. So I just want to make sure, right? Does that make sense for everyone in terms of the procedure? So uh, let me go ahead and go back to the share, and then uh, and then we will let's see because I. No, it's because I have two browsers open. Sorry about that. Okay. Hold on. Right, let me, okay, let me share it. Okay, all right. So going back to, to my contact information. So like I said, email or Blackboard messaging is the best way to get a hold of me because um, I'm not saying to don't call my office, but I'm hardly going to be in my office. I'm not going to be in my office that much at all. So um, I'm just being realistic and realistic with you all in terms of the expectation that you're probably not going to get a hold of me unless I'm in, uh, you know, you're probably not going to get a hold of me in the office, so to speak, right? So make sure that uh, that you um, 
make sure that you that you email me or send me a, a Blackboard message here. So, okay, and then the office hours, of course, I have office hours after this class, uh, four to six p.m. online. So if you, you know, and of course, if you're already in this class, you if you want to stick around and you know uh, ask me questions or talk to me, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, I also do have some in-person ones on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at seven to eight at Pecan, and then I've got some office hours at the, at the high school that I teach at. Um, so these. I mean, the online one is probably your best bet since we're having class right before it. So, um, you know, so so that's probably a good time to ask me questions if you'd like to. Uh, but again, I also have uh, uh, the in-person ones on Tuesday, Wednesday available. But yeah, I would probably recommend doing the online ones, especially since we're meeting online. Um, okay, um, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the class itself, and then and then we'll get to the most important thing that everyone wants to know is the is how you're going to be graded. Right? I think that's what everyone clicks on first. I know that that's what I do. Um, when I get my syllabus, I'm taking classes right now as well. Um, I just got admitted to uh, for a PhD in government, but I'm going to start it next year. So in the meantime, I'm doing some Kingsville uh, education, uh, uh, you know, so some education classes and things like that. But um, but in the, but but you know, but I'm gonna and then of course I'll I'll I'm gonna work on the PhD and then I'll finish those classes later on. So I just want to get the PhD first, but of course I couldn't go. I was planning on going this year, but. There was some financial aid issues, so I delayed it for a year. So in the meantime, I'm just going to be taking some education classes, but then I'll finish those after I finish the PhD starting next year. So, okay. But with that being said, um, so let's talk about the course description. Okay, so this is basically if we were to sum our sum up our class in one sentence, you know, um, this is basically how we do it, right? This course covers the origin and development of the Texas Constitution, structure and powers of state and local government, federalism, intergovernmental relations. Uh, political participation, the election process, public policy, and the political culture of Texas. Now, let me ask some of y'all this question. Well, let me ask you all this question. Now, have any of y'all taken federal government already or are in the process of taking federal government? Is it, you know, have y'all taken 2305 yet? Or is this the first time that you're taking uh, a government class here? Uh, okay, so Ashley says yes, yes, she has. Mia also says yes. Okay, that's good, um, because I definitely recommend that. Uh, I know that's not a requirement. Okay, so Jacob says it's my first government. Okay, all right, so, okay. Now, let me go ahead and explain why I prefer for students to have federal government first, because a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about here in Texas government is going to be, and, and we are gonna review a lot of these concepts anyway, so it's not the end of the world if you haven't taken federal government first, because we are going to, discuss separation of powers, checks and balances, and things like that. We are, we are going to discuss that a bit. It's just that we discuss, we, we, we take more time in federal government to, to discuss the basics of what government is, whereas in Texas, we kind of expand on what we've already have learned in federal government, because the way Texas government works is we're looking at how Texas relates to the federal government and the, re the unique relationship that Texas has as being one of the 50 states, the United States being the second largest, both in population and size. And so obviously, of course, Texas is gonna be a very important state within the United States. And so uh, it's important to understand how the federal government operates so that you can also uh, better understand how Texas operates within the federal system, right? So, so that's basically why I, I like that people take uh, federal government first. I mean, if it was up to me, I would make it a requirement where you have to take federal first and then Texas. I don't know why they don't make it a requirement. I mean, the reason why I say that is because Texas government is is if you if you don't if you haven't taken federal government and you're taking Texas first, it's almost like you're watching the sequel to a movie, but you don't but you didn't see the first one, right? So you're not quite sure who are the characters, what's going on. It can be a little bit confusing. I mean, yeah, I guess you could still you can still kind of enjoy it. Um, but it might be important to know like, you know, what's been, what happened before, right? You know, why are these characters here? Like, let's say, let's say you watch Back to the Future, like part two, but you haven't seen part one, you might be like, well, you know, what are they doing in the future, right? You know, things, you know, so you got, so that's just an example, right? But, but don't, don't despair. If, if you haven't taken federal government first, that's fine. You know, we'll catch you up to speed. There is a lot of review in Texas government, uh, but it usually is better, you know, to have that, uh, that background in federal government first, but that's fine. That's fine. We'll, we'll go ahead and just, uh, uh, we'll do we'll definitely do the best we can and we should be okay but yes but a lot of this stuff that you see here a lot of this is covered was covered in federal government and we and we will review it but we're going to tie it into how it relates to, to texas right like like i said how does texas fit into the national government spotlight right we're going to do a lot of comparing and contrasting within this class right because uh if we scroll on down here if we go to the course learning outcomes this expands on the course description so the course learning outcomes is explain the origin and development of the texas constitution 
describe state and local political systems and their relationship with the federal government, right? That, that's what we were just talking about, right? So we're going to be doing a lot of comparing and contrasting within this class because there's a lot of similarities that Texas has with the federal government, the, the state government of Texas. There's a lot of similarities they have with the federal government, which is the government of the United States, right? And then Texas, of course, is, is one of the 50 states here. But there's also just some differences, right? We're going to take a look at, um, like a good example would be the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of Texas. Now, they're similar in that just like the United States, Texas also has three branches of government, right? They're also similar in that Texas also follows the separation of powers and checks and balances system in Texas, right? You don't want to have, uh, you know, the governorship having more power in the state legislature, right? You know, you, you want to try to make sure that those powers are, are checked and balanced to where you have the three, you know, the, the, the three equal branches of government and you're not gonna have one overstepping their boundaries, right? Now, of course, we'll talk about the executive branch and how they usually tend to be the most likely of the three to try to overstep their boundaries. And, and of course, we'll also talk about a lot of some of the current events that are going on. Uh, like I'm sure you're familiar with what's going on with Ken Paxton, the attorney general and how he's been impeached. And we're gonna have the uh, the trial in the Senate coming up. Uh, of course, there's also been the, the issue with the buoy system and the Rio Grande and how the federal government has sued Texas, which, you might not think of this, but this actually happens more often than you think. Like, you know, have lawsuits between states and the federal government, uh, you know, either either the state trying to sue or the federal government suing the states. You know, this, this happens more often than you think, especially when you have, uh, especially when you have the leadership of both of these uh, entities uh, being on, you know, different ends of the political spectrum, right? So obviously Joe Biden, you know, president of the United States, President Biden being a Democrat, uh, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas being a Republican. So you can probably see that they're probably not going to see eye to eye on a lot of things politically. So that usually tends to happen whenever you have differences, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, political affiliation within those leadership roles, either in the within the federal government and the state, there's, there's usually going to be clashes, right? So as we're seeing right now with the buoy system in the Rio Grande, there's been, there, you know, obviously, of course, there's been a federal lawsuit. So we'll see how it uh, plays itself out. But I wanted to give you all that example, which we'll talk more about that in our class here. Okay, so excuse me, it's, it's been a long day. I had some classes earlier this morning. Plus, we're, we're just getting back from summer break, uh, summer vacation, so I'm still kind of like just kind of getting the swing of things here. Okay, so then obviously, of course, we've mentioned a little bit about the three branches of government and how there are they do have similarities. Um, you know, the executive branch still has, you know, the top executive in Texas, which is the governor. The legislature also is comprised of you know, two chambers, the House and the Senate, just like we have in Congress. Uh, but there are some differences. So so especially in the executive and the judicial branches, there are some differences as well as in the legislative. So in the executive branch, we have what's called the plural executive, uh, where, yes, the governor is regarded as like the top uh, executive official within the state. But the but unlike the federal government, where the president appoints the cabinet members. So if you took federal, you, you know that, right, that the president makes appointments to uh, the cabinet, you know, the, the heads of the uh, of a lot of these major agencies of the department, like the FBI director, uh, you know, that's appointed by the president. Um, and then, of course, they have to get confirmed by the Senate. That's called advising consent. It's in within the Constitution. But Texas does not run their executive branch like that, uh, except for a couple, like the Secretary of State, that's appointed by the governor. But almost all of the top uh, executive offices in Texas are not appointed by the governor, but instead they're uh, they're independently elected. So Dan Patrick, the current lieutenant governor, uh, Greg Abbott did not appoint him. Uh, Greg, uh, it's the Dan Patrick uh, had to run his own election, and he was able to win re-election. Uh, but Dan, but uh, Dan Patrick had to do that independently of Governor Greg Abbott, right? So so a lot, so all these executives, right? Like Ken Paxton, the Attorney General, like we talked about, you know. Um, you know, all these people like the comptroller and, and uh, the agriculture commissioner, that they are not appointed by the governor. They are independently elected. So what this means here is that you could have a situation in the future where let's say you have a Republican governor, but let's say you have a Democrat lieutenant governor or vice versa, right? And so that's going to be really interesting to see if that ever does happen in Texas, because I definitely want to see how, you know, people of opposing parties are going to have to try to, uh, you know, how they're going to have to try to negotiate and try to work together. So we haven't seen it yet uh, because Texas is still, you know, pretty much a Republican state. Uh, although the demographics are changing, but we'll, you know, but that, but we'll see how that uh, plays out. And, and like I said, we're going to talk about that here in, in one of our 
we'll talk about that here, you know, throughout the class in terms of, you know, is Texas a battleground state? You know, are they becoming more purplish, you know, than, than maybe bright red, so to speak, right? You know, so so we'll have those those good discussions here within our class. And then in the in the judicial branch, here's another major difference. At the federal level, uh, all federal judges are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, just like just like uh, you know the, the, the cabinet. Texas, though, also uses elections for judges, right? I don't know if any of y'all have seen signs. They're already putting up signs for. Uh, like I was, I was seeing some earlier today while I was driving, you know, to the classes, right? I already saw some signs for some of the local judgeship races that are coming up, right? Because we're going to be coming up on the primary season already, uh, you know, in March is, is when we, early March is when we have the primary. So the signs are already going up. So it's already, you know, we're already getting ready for campaign season and all that. I mean, so, so I want for y'all to pay attention to some of those signs because you're going to see that some of those signs are for judges. So in Texas, judges are elected, whether it's, the you know the justice of the peace you know the the uh, you know the, the lower level judges you know the the municipal court judges although some of them are appointed but some of them are elected uh, depending on what the city does uh, uh, we also have of course the county judges although they're called a judge but they're really more like an administrator than an actual judge although they do have they do have some judicial responsibilities but not too many uh, and then of course we like I said the district judges those are the ones that um, that handle like your felony cases and your major uh, you know, your major civil lawsuits and then moving up to the to the appeals courts and the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, all those people are elected. So that's a major difference that I want you all to understand from uh, the Texas does differently from the federal system. So again, and we'll talk more about this because just like in federal government, there are chapters devoted specifically to the Texas legislature, to the governorship and, and the rest of the executive officers and the, the Texas court system. So we'll talk about all that, uh, you know, here within our class. Evaluate the role of public opinion, interest groups, and political parties in Texas. So, again, some more similarities, right? That Texas has the same two major national political parties, right? The Republicans and the Democrats. There are, of course, Libertarians and Green parties and, and other third parties, but they don't really they they don't really have any traction here in Texas. You know, just like anywhere else in the country. Uh, public opinion, of course, we're going to take a look at uh, some you know some more review about you know what it means to be a liberal or or, or a conservative and what and where they stand on certain issues. We're going to take a look at and, and of course, you know, how people feel about what's going on in government. And, uh, you know, we're going to use a lot of uh, data and uh, surveys from the Texas Politics Project. It's a uh, it, it's a uh, it's a project that's being run out of UT Austin. And they do a lot of polling of Texans, especially when it comes to like, you know, issues. And especially when we're getting close to election season, you know, they'll, they'll be doing polls about how people feel about the candidates. So we'll, we'll take a look at a lot of that data here as well. Uh, interest groups, of course, we're going to, you know, we're going to take a look at some of the interest groups nationally and how they play roles in Texas, but also some more of these local interest groups. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Analyze the state and local election process. Now, this is very important to look at because in federal government, yes, we do cover elections, but we mostly cover the national stuff, right? We cover like the electoral college and, and where that came from and why is it that on election night, whenever we have a presidential election, which is going to be coming up next year, uh, we're always looking at the map. Why is it that the state's have some role when it comes to the election process. Well, you know, you know, obviously, of course, if you're familiar with, with, with the Electoral College, you know what the answer to that is, but we're also gonna take a look at the important responsibility that states have when it comes to elections, because elections, even federal elections, are administered by state and local governments. What I mean by this is that when you go vote, you know, I don't know if any of y'all voted before, but if, but if you go vote, you have to go to this polling location and then you check in with your ID and you meet with these uh, these uh, these officials that, you know, take down your information and then they set up the ballot for you. Right. Those are not federal employees. Those are local county employees. So the Adalo County Elections Department uh, hires these people. They're usually temp workers. That's why that's why I don't know if you've noticed that they're usually like older people because a lot of them are retirees because they were. Because, you know, I couldn't go do that with my current job, right? Like I would have to, you know, like, because I'm, I'm too busy, right? But for people who are retired, that's perfect for them. That's extra money to make. And that's, you know, and they have the time because they don't have an eight to five that they have to go to. Um, so take a look at that. Next time you go, that you'll probably see either older people or maybe some really younger people. Maybe they're college students. But you're not really going to see too many, like, you know, like middle-aged people because, you know, they're all working. Um, but the point is, is that the, the counties are the ones who administer the elections. They set up the polling locations. They actually tabulate the votes. And then they have to report that information to the states, to the Secretary of State's office, who then certifies the election. So, and that goes for all elections, right? You know, not, not just not just local elections, but also the national election too. That's why there's some good resources that I have about the Bush v. Gore situation and how uh, local governments in Florida 
in terms of the decisions that they made with how the ballots looked, those decisions were so important that it pretty much decided who the next president of the United States was going to be in the year 2000. So, so that's an example of how I want to explain that you know the local governments are the ones who design the ballots and 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 uh, and there is some oversight though because we do have there's a good video that talks about the FEC and how they provided funding to kind of modernize uh, a lot of these ballots. That's why, like in Hidalgo County, uh, you see that they have the the touchscreen voting kiosks now. Uh, in a lot of larger counties that have a lot more money coming in through taxes, you'll see them have more state of the art electoral systems. But then, like let's say, like in Star County, they'll still have like the paper ballots, you know, and things like that. So usually, the more rural counties aren't going to have the money to be able to afford some of these voting kiosks. So instead, they kind of still go with like pen and paper type of things, you know, and things like that. So, but anyway, we'll talk more about that in the class here. Um, identify the rights and responsibilities of citizens and analyze issues, uh, policies, and the political culture of Texas. So we're definitely going to take a look at uh, the first chapter talks about the political culture of Texas and why Texas tends to be uh, conservative. There's some historical reasons for that, uh, but we'll, we'll get into that uh, uh, next week when we get to, when, when we go over chapter one here. Okay, so, okay, so, um, so let's, let's talk about the core objectives really quickly. So when it comes to, when it comes to this, now, I don't want you all to stress out too much about this because this is what you're going to be doing already within our class to begin with, right? Because the reason why we have these core objectives is that the state of Texas, through the Texas Education Coordinating Board and other oversight, uh, you know, abilities, they they are trying to ensure that you all are meeting certain core objective requirements. That it's not enough just to learn the material and to pass the class. You also have to demonstrate what you've learned in the class within our class, you know, through through certain examples, which that's what the core objectives matrix shows. It, it gives the example of how you're gonna show these types of skills. And you, as you can see that a lot of it is through the final project. You're also gonna do that through the quizzes and assignments that you are gonna be doing. So the reason why I say not to worry about this too much everyone is because I don't want you to be like, oh, like did I do enough critical thinking skills? You know, have I demonstrated communication skills? When in reality, you're going to be doing that already with the assignments and the requirements that you have within this class, right? So for critical thinking skills to be able to include creative thinking, innovation, inquiry, and analysis, evaluation, and synthesis of information, don't worry, those are just really fancy terms right there. Basically what it means is that can you think outside the box, right? Can you can you think about what we're going to talk about and expand upon it and, and, and explain why this is important? That's basically what critical thinking skills are, and we're going to do this with, within our class when we uh, discuss certain events. Uh, like I said, we're going to keep track on what's going on within Texas government. Uh, you know, you know, you know, pretty much by the minute here, and so we'll be able to bring all that stuff into the classroom so that we can have you know some pretty good discussions, right? Uh, communication skills. This also builds on this, right? You're going to be able to express yourself uh, not just through you know verbal communication, but also through written, you know, through the the discussions that we have. You know, you know, also you know the the actual you know written discussions that we have in our class, right? Not just what we talk about here in the meetings, but also uh, answering the discussion board questions and things like that, and being able to collaborate with your classmates here. Um, personal responsibility, of course, discusses the, 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 to include the ability to connect choices, actions, and consequences to ethical decision-making, right? So this is the whole idea that how do all of these political events and this political knowledge that you're going to gain in this class, how does this affect your decision-making as a citizen within society? How does it impact how you view about politics? And does it change your mind about some of these things now that you're going to be in some of these issues now that you're going to be getting more information? That's basically what personal responsibility is, right? To, to understand that it is important to, to keep up with what's going on in politics, to be aware, you know, and, and, and using that uh, and not just not just being aware of what's going on, but also how that makes you feel, right? How do you internalize that? How do you how do you uh, view those topics and those issues, right? Those, those are, are extremely important. And that also leads you to the last one, social responsibility, uh, to include intercultural competence, knowledge of civic responsibility, and the ability to engage effectively in regional, national, and global communities. What all this means here is how can you take that, that self-realization that you were able to you know, determine about yourself within personal responsibility, how do you take that personal responsibility and apply it to society as a whole? Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you have to go and volunteer to get people registered to vote or be an activist or things like that. But I want you to understand, and of course, you're more welcome, you're welcome to do that if you want to on your own. But what I'm but the point of social responsibility is, is excuse me, is I want for you all to understand why people do this. Okay. 
why is there political activism? Why do people go protest? Why do people try to meet with elected officials and try to contact them? Because they have a personal responsibility that then uh, shifts into social responsibility because they feel that they have the skills, the talents, the abilities to try to, you know, to, to try to see if they can advocate for change and not just change for themselves, but change for their own communities, right? You know, so if, let's say, uh, you know, you're, you're, you, you know, you see something that's going on that you, you feel is unfair and you want, uh, you know, for, for government to take a look at this or maybe change what they're doing. Um, it might not even be something that is personally affecting you. It could be something that's affecting your your family, right? Or friends or, you know, things you've seen, even if it doesn't necessarily affect you, it's something that you still don't want to see and you want change. So that's an example of social responsibility right here. So again, you're going to be able to demonstrate all this in our class. So don't worry too much about, you know, actually defining it while we're doing the class because it's going to be embedded with what we do here. Okay. Okay. Let's get to the course requirements. Right, let me just take a, another drink of water here. Let's get to the course requirements. I think this is what everyone is always uh, really interested in, in seeing, right? Okay, so really quickly, let me show you all the grade breakdown before we actually go over this. So, um, so it's pretty it, it, it it's pretty close along you know in in terms of along the across the board here. Um, see, don't even think of the exams as forty percent because there's four exams, right? So so you so technically the best way to look at it it would be like 10, 10, 10, and 10, right? So, you know, because each exam is 10%. So what I'm trying to do here is I set the grade weights to where they're not, there's not one category that's really, really high. If you look at the exams, it's just basically being, you know, four tens, then, you know, the highest percentage of one, you know, of one thing is, is 20%. And, and there's only one assignment that has the full weight because there's one and that's the signature assignment. That's the only one where that that one assignment is worth 20%. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? Because as we went up here, notice that the signature assignment is in all four of these, right? You know, because that is the best way that you're going to be able to demonstrate all of this. I mean, you're going to demonstrate it in other ways, but the signature assignment final project is the best way to, uh, you know, it's the, well, not the best, it's the, it's the more concrete way of, of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of satisfying these core objective requirements, which is why it carries the most weight of any individual assignment. And it is, I would say, the most important, right? Okay, so when it comes to exams, um, again, they're they're uh, very straightforward. The exams are 10% uh, each, you know, totaling 40%. Uh, I do want to mention that the exams are open book, open notes, so that you can use uh, your book, your notes, uh, anything that you, uh, the outlines, anything that you would like to use. Um, just make sure though, because the, 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 the exams are going to be on the on the lockdown browser. Again, it's not gonna flag you if you're using your book because the video goes to me, right? So if I see you using the book, then that's not gonna be a problem, right? Because I'm giving you all that permission. What I'm looking for when I review the video is I'm looking to make sure that there's not two of you all taking the same the test at the same time, because that's not allowed. So you all can't collaborate, but you still have to take the test on your own. But if you wanna use whatever resources you all would like to use, then you're more than welcome to do so, right? So um, so that's what I, so that's what, um, you know, so that's the expectation that I have. You take the test on your own, but you can use whatever resources to help you all out, uh, on the test here. Okay. And there's also going to be study guides as well that I'm going to include for you all to, to, to help you with that. And there are, and there are extra credit opportunities within the study guide. Basically, I guess I'll explain it right now that, that the study guides, uh, they're not going to be exactly the way the test is because, uh, let me explain how the tests work in that. Not everyone is going to get the same uh, test. Let me see. There's a question in the chat here. Can we use the book on an electronic? Uh, okay, yes, Mia. That's actually a very good question. Yes, you can, um, because I know some of y'all are using the ebook, right? So, what I would recommend for you to do if you're going to do that is um, take your whatever electronic device it is, whether it's your phone or a tablet or wherever laptop, and I want you to show the screen to the to the to the camera. And the reason why I want you to do that is because I want for you, like, I, I don't want for there to be any doubt that what you're accessing is, you know, is the book, you know, for the class, right? Um, that way there's no, you know, not, not that there would be any accusations of cheating, but that way that covers yourself in case anything were like to happen or something like that. I don't know if that makes any sense, just that you cover yourself. And the reason why I, 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 I want y'all to do this is because I have some personal experience with this. When I was working in security at STC many years ago, I used to be a security supervisor. Uh, what I would do is I was I, I kind of worked at night. So I would be responsible for taking in the lost and found items. 
that would be turned into our department. So we had a camera set up right in front, like, like right above where the lost and found area was. So what I would do is anytime I received an item, and of course I had to tag it and document and things like that. So we had an official log of all the items that were coming in. Uh, but what I would do is I would, I would, I would hold up the item to the camera and wait, you know, for a couple of a seconds so that the camera would get a good look at what the item was. And then I would put it in the, in the drawer that we had. And the reason why I did that was because I wanted to ensure that no one would ever come back and accuse me of stealing things out of the lost and found. No, because look, I showed it to the camera. You can go back and watch the video. There it is. Uh, you do not see me go back and take anything out of it, you know, later. So no, I'm not the one who, because we, unfortunately we did have some situations where there was some stuff missing, but it wasn't me because like I said, you know, I, I made sure that I covered myself. So, so I want you all to do a similar thing where you cover yourself, um, you're, you know, so that way there's no, there's no issues in case, you know, anyone wants to come back and uh, make any accusations of cheating because unfortunately the college is really cracking down on this, on this cheating, especially when it comes to the AI stuff. Uh, you know, so, so that's definitely an emphasis that the college has. So, so for you all's sake, I, I would definitely recommend to do that just in case there's uh you know, just in case there, there's any, uh, you know, so that way, so that way you're covered, you know, and, and you don't have any issues, but yes, yes, me, you're welcome. So yes, yeah, so, but you, but, but it's open note, open book, uh, whatever resources y'all want to use. You know what I'm going to do so. Okay, uh, so there's four exams. Uh, there's going to be four exams because there's going to be four units that we're going to be covering. Okay, now let's go to the Blackboard discussions. Now, I think some of y'all have done discussions before, right? Um, and I use the same standard formula. I know I got this from one of my graduate professors, but I know he didn't make it up. I know this has probably been going on for a while where you do the three total posts, you answer the question, and then you respond to two other classes, right? That's usually what the standard procedure is. Now, What's different with me, and maybe this is the same with other professors, I'm sure they have some sort of word count requirement as well, is that I write, I do have a word length requirement, a sentence uh, requirement, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you all some examples of how to do the discussions. And I think there's a video that, that talks about this as well that I think I've uploaded. So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna walk you all through, you know, walk you through, if I was in this class, how would I answer the question uh, so I, you know, so I could give you all an example, and and I'll give you all another example uh, whenever we finish uh, the unit, when we get to the 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 unit discussion, because right, there's going to be four discussions uh, because there's a discussion per unit, right? So when we get close to the end of the unit, then we can go over the discussion question. That's what we can do in class as well. We can take a little bit of time to go over the discussion question, so I can give you all some points and some you know some hints uh, in terms of what you know. Again, how would I do this if I was in you all's position? But so let me kind of give you a quick example. So like, let's say. Um, Let's say I believe that. Let's see. So, so let's say we 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 decided to go with. Um, let me let me let me give you this question. So, chapter two is talking about the Texas Constitution. Let's say I wanted to give you all a discussion question where you compared and contrast the Texas Constitution to the to the to the federal Constitution, right? Now, the federal Constitution is rather short. Uh, you could probably read it in about thirty minutes. It's only got ten articles uh, with some sections uh, in in there. Not all the articles have as many sections. Like I know. Article one is the longest. It has 10 sections that deals with Congress. Uh, and then as you go forward, like I think the the the, the article two of the presidency, I think that only has five, I believe. So, you know, and, and then the, the 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 federal courts is even shorter. I think that one is just three. So so as you move forward, you know, the 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 articles get even shorter. And then of course we have the the 27 amendments, and then that's it. Now the reason for that is because the the federal constitution was constructed in a way to allow for flexibility, to allow for uh you know, you know, for not everything to be so clear cut, there's room for interpretation. And that's why we have a lot of Supreme Court decisions that weigh in on some of these constitutional issues, because the Constitution is so short that it's not going to be able to be as specific about every single political question or, or constitutional question out there, right? It allows for the courts to kind of have some leeway to be able to interpret the Constitution, right? And then to be able to give their, their, their opinion, which ultimately becomes the law of the land, because in federal government, for those of you who took it, uh, you probably know why. Whenever the Supreme Court makes a decision, you know everybody stops what they're doing, right? And the news, uh, the news people cover the Supreme Court decision for the day, right? Because the Supreme Court has the right through judicial review to review the constitutionality of laws and executive orders and state laws and things like that to ensure that they are constitutional. And if they're not constitutional, then they can get overturned, and then you know, that, that 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 law is no longer valid, right? Because the Supreme Court has ruled that that is unconstitutional. Basically, the Supreme Court is like a ref, is like the referee for the government, basically. So 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 that's the way our, our, our federal constitution is set up. It does allow for that interpretation by the courts. Uh, and that's why we have a lot of these court decisions. 
In Texas, though, Texas has the opposite type of setup. Texas has a very wordy, lengthy constitution with not much room for interpretation. Everything's in there. It's very, you know, it's very detailed. There's over 500 amendments to the Texas Constitution. I think there's going to be some more this year because uh, there were some some constitutional amendments that were proposed by the legislature, which we're going to talk about what, how that process works. So that is the opposite, right? Where you don't have interpretation. It's all there, right? And you have to read through everything. That's why if you're like a state rep or a state senator, it, it, it's, it's going to be hard to, uh, you know, to do stuff because you're going to have to read the thing and you're going to have to see like what's a lot of what is it. Now, if I gave you a discussion question where you were to determine which of those two you would prefer, then I would want for you to use examples uh, from the readings, from what we've covered in class to be able to answer that question. Because the purpose of these discussion questions is for me to determine, did you read through the material? Did you learn the material? Do you understand the material? Because are you able to apply that material to these critical thinking questions, right? Going back to the, you know, to, to the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, Going back to the core objectives, right? You know, can you demonstrate critical thinking skills? Well, you're going to have to, you're going to have to demonstrate critical thinking skills in the discussions because you're not going to be able to get a good grade if you're not critically thinking within the discussion. So you see, there you go. There's an example of how you're going to be doing this within our class anyway. So that's what I would recommend, right? To give examples. If you give examples in the discussions, I guarantee you that you're going to do well in the discussions because that's what I'm looking for. When I'm reading through discussion posts, I'm looking for examples from the readings. Um, so, because again, like I said, it's, it's gonna show whether you read you read or not. So definitely give those examples to, to make your argument stronger. And I can guarantee you that you'll, you'll do good on the discussions. And there is a rubric that I use to grade the discussions. So you'll be able to see that as well when I give feedback and things like that. Uh, now for the two responses, as you can see, the word length is less, right? So for the, for the initial post, you have to do 200 words uh, and then hundred words for the two responses. Now. Usually students do very well on the, in, the initial post because obviously, of course, that's answering the question, but responding to classmates, and I do get it, is a little bit more difficult, a little more challenging because I've seen a lot of responses where it's basically just people giving their opinions, which is fine, but you also need to be able to back up those opinions. So that question would actually be a very good one to use because you could have disagreements, right? Because I'm asking you to either agree or disagree with one or the other, right? So by agreeing with the federal constitution, you pretty much are disagreeing with how Texas does it, right? Or vice versa. So that would be a great discussion question for you all to jump in to disagree with, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with disagreements. In fact, I welcome disagreements. I want for there to be disagreements in our class because if no one is, if we're just all agreeing with everything, then we're not really looking at different perspectives, right? We're just kind of just agreeing with everyone and we don't really learn anything differently. So I want you all to disagree. Now, of course, I expect for you all to disagree respectfully. This is not you know, Twitter, or I think what's well, X now, right? But, you know, but you, but, you know, it used to be called Twitter. It's not Facebook, it's not social media. We're not gonna be trolling each other and, and, and laughing at each other. We're not gonna have any, we're not gonna have any of that, right? Because this is an academic setting. I expect for everyone to respect each other. It's okay to disagree. And like I said, I welcome it, but you have to respect where everyone's coming from, right? Because there's a reason why people have the political viewpoints that they have, the, the answers that they're giving, they're coming from somewhere, right? It's not just someone just coming, you know, political viewpoints are not, we're not born with them, right? This, uh, this is things that we learn through uh, things we were taught in class, experiences that we go through uh, or experiences that we've seen. I know I can say that for myself that, you know, family pretty much influenced my politics to begin with. Then life experiences started to shift it as well. Not just things that happened to me, but also things that happened to my family, to my friends, or even just things that I've seen in the news about how people have been treated, right? Even people that I don't know and I can have reactions to that, right? So, so the point I'm trying to make is that the answers that you all give, because we are in a political science class, uh, some of this is going to be very personal for people, right? You know, politics is very personal for people. That's why a lot of people don't like to talk about it, because it's almost like if you disagree with someone politically, it's almost like you're attacking them, right? It's like, oh, like I like like you think like like you're 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 dissing them, right? Like, you know, there's something wrong with you if, if, if you don't see things the way I see it, right? That there's a lot of that going on right now. And so I don't want, so I do understand that. And that's why I don't want you all to get so like, you know, I don't want you all to take this so personally if someone just disagrees with you, right? And I also expect you all to not take personally if they disagree with you, right? You know, it's just, it's meant as a way to, to, to get to see where everyone sees these issues, right? And maybe learn some things from different people, right? So, so I think we'll have a pretty good, uh, we'll have a pretty good uh, class culture in our class, you know, that, you know, now that I'm setting those expectations, which again, I mean, you all are college students, you all know how to do that anyway. 
but yes, but in, in terms of the responses, I want for you all to give examples still, right? So if you, if let's say, you know, you saw that someone posted they preferred the, the, the federal constitution, but you prefer how Texas does it, then explain why you prefer Texas. Give some examples as to why the Texas constitution you feel is the superior uh, method for writing up constitutions, right? Don't just agree or disagree, right? I need for you to give examples as to why, right? Like, you know, maybe you like the idea that judges are elected in Texas because maybe that gives, that allows for judges to have to keep, uh, you know, trying to do a good job to keep their jobs, right? We're at the, whereas at the federal level, they have the lifetime appointments, right? So some people might feel that the election process, they might like that better because they, they might feel that, you know, that keeps the judges, you know, still needing to get support of the public. But then at the flip side, someone might say, well, but then does the, does a judge become no different than a politician who has to try to get votes and, uh, you know, you know, could that also be a conflict of interest, so to speak, right? If let's say, and and we will talk about it in, in the courts chapter because there have been allegations, well, not necessarily allegations, but there have been criticisms of the Texas uh, electoral system for judges because of the, you know, the, the campaign money. There's a good 60 minutes uh, video that we're going to talk about that, 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 that I definitely recommend for you all to watch that uh, discusses it. It's, it's a little bit older. It's from the 1980s. It's uh, It looked at the campaign contributions that uh, these uh, Texas judges were getting. And, and a lot of that money was coming from attorneys, right? Even attorneys that have cases before those same judges, right? So you can already kind of see where I'm getting at, right? That that could be considered a conflict of interest. If if you're working with someone uh, and you donate to their campaign, you know, is everything gonna be on the up and up? Or, or, or something even, even, that video even talks about how some attorneys didn't even want to make those contributions, but they felt like they had to because they felt that the judge might you know, might not be able to, you know, look at their case fairly if they knew that that lawyer did not contribute. So, so again, and I'm not saying that that actually happened. I'm just saying that this is the, this is the, the, how do I say it? This, this was the, there's a word I'm looking for that that was, you know, that, that that's what it looked like, I guess you could say, right? That it, that, that it looked like there might've been uh, some impropriety going on. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll get more into that when we get to uh, uh, chapter, uh, the, the, uh, Texas courts chapter, but yeah. So anyway, so, and again, these are not mutually exclusive. Again, you have to make sure that you, uh, and what I mean by this is that you don't just write a hundred words and then, okay, I did my hundred words. You have to make sure that you're actually answering the question, right? Or, you know, responding, right? So if, let's say you do the 200 words, but you didn't respond, you didn't, you didn't complete all of the, 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 the question because sometimes there's gonna be like two or three questions embedded in the full question. So let's say you only answer two out of the three, but you did the 200 words, then that's also going to cost against you because you need to you need to make sure that you answer all of the sub questions. So if you have to write more, then you have to write more. Then so be it, right? You know, I did that a lot in grad school where uh, I had this one professor. He wanted us to turn in uh, every week. We had to turn in a um, we had to turn. In, I think it was a two to four uh, response paper for the for the uh, for the articles that we read. And I always ended up doing like five to seven because I I write a lot, you know, so, uh, so, and he said he appreciated that, you know, because yeah, I wasn't just going to be like, okay, there's two, there's two pages I'm done, but yeah, you didn't, you didn't answer the, well, it wasn't one article. It was several articles we had to do every week. So let's say we had to do three articles and I only talked about two of them in the two pages. Well, I'm not done because I still have to do the third article. So I expect the same thing from you all that, that if you haven't answered all the sub questions and you're already at 200 words, make sure that you answer that last one or else that's going to cost you. So Okay, then of course we have the the uh, Blackboard uh, quizzes and assignments, and then of course we have the signature assignment, which we're going to take more time to go over this as we get closer to the, you know, as like when we get to the midpoint of the semester, uh, we'll take a class period to actually go over it. Um, the information is over here. Um, sorry about that. Um, there is the folder that discusses the signature assignment in greater detail. Uh, there is a video that I have uploaded. Okay, it's not it's not showing up. I'll make sure that it that it shows up here. Um, but uh, but but over here, yeah, let me just go ahead and make it uh, visible here because I, I think I need to change the, no, I, yeah, I do need to change the due dates. I'm sorry about that, everyone. It's because there's, uh, uh, these these due dates are from the the summer two where I was also teaching Texas government. So I do need to go and I need to uh, update those uh, due dates. Just just bear with me. It's because we, you know, we've been told a lot of things this week. So I'll make sure that I, I uh, shift those due dates forward. Unfortunately, Blackboard does not have the ability to shift due dates from a previous semester. I have to go in and painstakingly click on every assignment and change the date. It doesn't do it for me automatically. Some of the other LMSs do, but this one doesn't. So that's why it takes a while to go and 
as you can tell, I'm probably not that big of a fan of Blackboard. I mean, it's all right. It, it, it does its purpose. It's what I, I learned when I was going to school. Uh, but now that I've taught at other places and I've seen other LMSs, I, I, there are some that I feel that are a little bit better than Blackboard. But all of them have their pros and cons. But yeah, so I'm going to change these due dates. So there's going to be a rough draft here. Uh, that's also going to be the final submission. And uh, But like I said, when, when it's time for a rough draft, which will probably be like in October, uh, we'll go over it. Uh, because over here, if you click on this, this gives you the, the actual description here. Uh, where you can download the, the document. There's also the rubric here uh, sorry, the, the, that I'll be using here. And then again, this is the video if you want to look at it later. Uh, but again, we're going to have a, a full class where we discuss it as well. So, okay, so I guess since we're on that topic, let me just kind of scroll through every, really quickly. Uh, make sure that you all complete the introductory discussion on the syllabus acknowledgement. Uh, that's going to be due tomorrow because I have to, and you don't need the book for this. That's why uh, I, I assigned that. So, Make sure that you get that done by tomorrow because I also have to enter in uh, roster verification. Like I have to enter in the 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 the, uh, the attendance rosters for uh, you know for STC. So you know because the federal government, you know, I think some of y'all are getting financial aid, right? So the federal government has to verify that you actually are attending class and not just taking money from the federal government. So that's why the colleges have to submit those uh, those attendance reports. So this will count as attendance for online class because the way online classes determine attendance is not just by showing up to a meeting, right? It's you have to actually complete an assignment. So these are two, these are the two uh, first week assignments that I have for you all. So please make sure that you all complete them. All pretty easy, just introduce yourself and then uh, and then also uh, click that you read and, uh, read and understand the syllabus. So, okay, so that's pretty much it. Then of course we have the four, uh, the four units or four sections and that's why they're gonna be four exams because there's gonna be uh, four, sec four units. And then of course we also have the unit discussion towards the end of the, of the unit here. Uh, there's also additional resources. Also, please keep in mind that these are optional. So you don't have to click on them. There's a bunch of them. You probably look and say, wow, this guy has like all the time in the world to include all this stuff. Well, I don't because some I do need to add more. Some stuff has also happened in the last year that I need to add. So I'll be doing that throughout the semester as well. So I'll be adding stuff about Ken Paxton and all that stuff. So so just, just bear with me. But again, it's, it's totally optional. You don't have to click on everything. Um, of course, we also have the study guides here. Uh, there might be some extra credit. We'll see. That was for last semester, but We'll see. Maybe maybe I'll I'll uh, I'll include an, another assignment or something like that. But yeah. So like I said, I'll be making this available for you all to look at. Uh, and that's pretty much the way our our class is set up. So let me just go ahead and go back to the. Uh, let me stop the share. Let me go back to the syllabus really quickly. Um, okay, I clicked out of it. So let me go ahead and find it again really quickly. So that that way, I, let's see. I know I had it here. Okay, there we go. Let me go ahead and share the screen again. So, um, and we're almost done here. We just got a couple of minutes and then we'll leave. So, okay. Okay. All right. So that's pretty much the, the grade breakdown. Um, also do keep in mind that you do have to use the Respondus Lockdown Browser. Again, like I said, you're going to be able to use your notes, but you do have to use the Lockdown Browser. That is a requirement for, for any test that, that SCC has. That's an SCC uh, requirement. Um, okay. So the book here is uh, Texas Politics, Ideal and Reality. Um, so I know some of y'all have, have already reached out to me about like the different editions. Um, look, so I'm not strict about the editions. It's you all's money. I'm not strict about that. I mean, this of course is the official book that we are gonna be using, but you know, look, look, let me let me give you all an analogy in terms of how I view like textbooks in different editions. Now, let me ask you all this question. Do any of y'all play like sports games? Like, what is it like Madden or I used to play Madden all the time. I mean, I know, you know, I used to play it all the time back when I was, when I was, when I had a lot more time. But any of these games like FIFA or anything like that. So, so if you all have ever played any of those sports games, do you 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 do know that every year it's basically the same game, right? I mean, they might make a few changes, but it's basically the same game, right? You're just playing, you know, you're playing the sport, right? And then the the, the major change they usually see is like the rosters, right? Where there's new players, you know, new rookies coming into the league. Some players have retired, and there and of course, obviously, some players have changed teams. So that's usually the difference, right? That's how I like to compare these additions to the books in that. The core information is pretty much the same, right? We're still going to be covering the same type of course learning outcomes, right? All the additions have all this, right? They have, they have chapters on the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. They talk about elections, you know? So the only major difference is that we have new elections that happen. We have new events that happen. Like I know that, you know, that this newer edition is, 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 is going to have something about the 2021 freeze that we had, right? Remember that freeze uh, a couple of years ago in February? Where we lost power and people were unfortunately or you know were having a tough time in their homes and some people lost their lives unfortunately so you know so obviously of course that's going to be a big deal that you're going to see in the newest edition but you won't see it in the older edition because it hadn't happened yet when the book was published so 
other than those events and elections, you know, it's pretty much the same book. So I'll fill you all in on that information. So again, the the, the this is the the 13th one is the one we're going to be officially be using. But again, as I mentioned, um, it's up to you all because it's y'all's money. But you know, I, I would definitely recommend to get the, the newest one. But I understand that money's tough. And I also want to mention really quickly to you all that uh, here at STC we are trying to work on a uh, an open educational resource, a free book for Texas government. Uh, there isn't one out there, but we're, we're, we're trying. And so that's something that I'm assisting with. So we'll see if I, if I have time to do it. I, I said I would, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to. But anyway, so um, just really quickly before we leave, just make sure that you're familiar with Netiquette. Uh, we kind of talked about a little bit in terms of how we, we, we interact with each other. Okay, the tennis policies, uh, some of this is mostly for face-to-face, -face, but you know, just, you know, just know that, uh, just make sure that, like I said, that you attend class and that you know, if something comes up, you let me know. Uh, this is the topic outline. So again, we're going to have to change this already a bit because, um, you know, we, we had that issue with with, with, with the, the collaborate disappearing. So we're, we're going to start on chapter one next time. Also do keep in mind that uh, we have off on Monday for Labor Day. So we're not going to meet again until Wednesday, right? Um, so we'll do our best. I think we can try to cover what we need to for chapter one. Uh, so that way we can, we, we don't get too far behind. Uh, but yeah, so we're, so we're going to meet again on Wednesday. We'll do, so this is kind of already going to shift uh, forward a bit. So so again, this is just a plan, right? This is, uh, so I don't think we're gonna have the first exam on September 11th. I think, I think we'll move it to the next week, uh, you know, so that we can have time to cover all this. Cause I'm not gonna give you all an exam if we haven't covered all of the material that we need to, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we're gonna have to cover every single thing in the chapter, right? But we'll, we'll cover the main points, uh, you know, cause the, the semester goes by really quickly. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk to you all about really quickly. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna stop the share here. Does anyone have any questions before we leave for today? Is there any other questions, comments, uh, concerns, anything that I can help you all out before we leave for today? Is there anything that you all have questions about? Um, and by the way, I'm, and I'm gonna figure out how to upload these uh, for you all to watch later. So, uh, but yeah, I wanted to know if anyone, any of y'all had any questions or anything like that that I could help you all with before we leave for today. Anything, is there anything that, any, any assistance that you all need, anything? Nothing. Okay. Jacob says nothing. Okay. All right. So nothing else from her. Okay. Ashley. No. Okay. Explained everything well. Okay. Thank you, Mia. I appreciate that. Um, okay, everyone. All right. So sounds good. So like I said, just, just finish the, the, those two discussions by tomorrow. If you haven't already done so, I'll be grading those uh, this weekend. Uh, and also it's a good way to get you all off on the right foot. Cause if you do that, I'll, I'll tell you right now, you're going to get a good grade. So, um, but okay, everyone. All right. Sounds good. Let's go ahead and end for today. Thank you all so much. Uh, you all take care, be safe. Uh, have a good Labor Day weekend, and I'll see you all next Wednesday. Okay, so don't don't show up on Monday because I won't be here. I'll probably, well, I'll be working probably. I'll probably be grading stuff and getting ready for the week because I don't really have any time off. I, I even though I had off, I was teaching online in the summer, so I really didn't have too much time off. But anyway, but with that being said, so uh, you all take care. Hope you all have a, a much uh, more fun Labor Day than I will. So you all take care, be safe, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Okay, thank you all, everyone. Thank you all. Take care and uh, be safe, everyone. Thank you. Okay, you too, Ashley. Thank you. Take care. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye. Take care.